This is Mark Patterson, former mayor of the city of Troy, first mayor of the city of Troy uh, in 32 years. I was elected in 1995 and served for two terms, eight years, as the mayor of Troy. And I'm on the podcast of uh, Troy, tell me again. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on Troy Story, a podcast for the Collar City. Hello, and welcome to Troy Story, a podcast that explores the history of Troy, New York, one conversation at a time. I'm your host, John Salka. In our previous episode, we took a closer look at the two most recent years in the Collar City's history, 2022 and 2023. For Chapter 2, we're going to be taking a journey back almost 30 years to the distant past known as the 1990s. The year was 1995. Coolio's Gangsta's Paradise, TLC's Don't Go Chasing Waterfalls, and Seal's Kiss from a Rose were dominating the charts. President Bill Clinton was grappling with Speaker Newt Gingrich and a newly empowered Republican House of Representatives. Michael Jordan officially announced his return to the Chicago Bulls. And a man named Mark Pattison was deciding whether to run for mayor of a small upstate city called Troy, New York. The 1990s were a tough time for the Collar City. Troy's leaders were grappling with shrinking revenues and increased expenses, coupled with tens of millions of dollars in debt. A mayoral election was approaching that would decide who would lead the city through the next four years. Former Troy Mayor Mark Pattison is our guest for Chapter 2, the person elected to guide the city through the choppy waters of the city's near bankruptcy and his administration's implementation of serious budgetary oversight, which in part saved the city from insolvency and put it on a path towards a brighter future. This was a really fascinating interview that covers a lot of ground. So much, in fact, that this will be a two-part episode. Part two will be released next week, so stay tuned for that. During the interview, Mark revisited his early life growing up in Rensselaer County, the Pattison family's seven-generation connection to the Collar City, his involvement in his father's successful campaign for Congress in 1974 following the Watergate scandal and President Nixon's resignation, and his two terms as mayor leading the Collar City, including through the previously mentioned major financial crisis in the 1990s. We also explore the razor-thin margin in the 1995 mayoral election and that early morning phone call he received that changed the trajectory of Troy forever. Thank you to everyone who checked out Chapter 1 and returned for Chapter 2. As always, please visit TroyStoryPod.com for the latest news on upcoming episodes, special bonus content, and to sign up for email updates. Also, please consider leaving a review of the show on Apple Podcasts. Reviews are the most effective way to help people find the show, and we'd love to hear from you. Lastly, if you have an idea, suggestion, or feedback on the show, drop us a line at mail at troystorypod.com. So, without further ado, let's dive into part one of our interview with Mark Pattison, former mayor of the city of Troy. All right, I am sitting in the home of former Troy Mayor Mark Pattison. Mark is uh, our second ever guest on Troy Story Podcast. Mark, huh? thank you for agreeing to do this. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Glad to do it. Um, just jump right into it. Uh, you were the mayor of Troy from 1996 to 2003? Yep. First first mayor of Troy uh, in 32 years. The charter changed, right? So the way they went from... From a ma- elected mayor, Neil Keller, who was the last elected mayor, um, Neil Keller, senior, uh, and then they went to a city manager form of government for 32 years. And what and what what precipitated that? What was the reason for the switch? Do you know what that back was? then? I think it was just the idea of professional management uh, in the city. Uh, there was a city manager uh, form of government was a progressive movement. It's used lots of places. Uh, didn't. Didn't, uh, doesn't work in every place. So, so. You grew up in Rensselaer County, um, yeah. specifically Sand Lake. Yeah, we grew up in West Sand Lake. We, we lived in, in West Sand Lake. We moved there. I think I went to kindergarten there. My father was grew up in uh, uh, Brunswick. He came back from the service in Texas and uh, uh, joined the law, Patterson Law Firm and uh, bought a house in West Sand Lake, and that's where we... We lived. We moved from my grandparents' house in Brunswick Hills to to uh, West Sand Lake. We just moved there while the house was being sort of readied. So you lived there until you were eighteen. I lived there until I went to college. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What was Rensselaer County like 
Uh, Troy, Runcer County, West. Yeah. I know you kind of, you know, Troy is a, is a major city compared to yeah. probably port parts of Runcer County at the time. But what was it like at the at that era? Uh, West St. Lake's a rural uh, community. Uh, it would always take me 45 minutes to pick up my friends in my car before we actually could go somewhere. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Halloweening was not a profitable experience unless you went up to one of the the developments. You know, you had to find a place to it was more dense, um, but it was, you know, great life, a garden, uh, father made me mow the lawn, we had 13 and a half acres of lawn, he'd say, you know, uh, 15 minutes a day, Mark, and uh, you'll get it done, and I'd wait till Saturday, and I'd be trying to mow the lawn in the dark to <laughs> to get it done. Of course, the day I went to college, he bought a rider lawnmower. Sure, you know. sure, that's usually how it works. Yeah. Did you often get down to Troy when you were kids, when you were living Not out? Not too Wilson? often, although my father's, the, the Patterson Law Firm's in Troy. And uh, my big uh, experiences in going to Troy were with my grandfather. We would go to uh, church with uh, my grandfather. He would take, you know, sometimes all 16 grandchildren uh, down to down to St. Paul's. And uh, after church, he'd, we'd leave early. He liked the, the uh, readings, but he wasn't a big fan of the sermons. So who, when the kindergarten, when the church classes left, we'd leave and... Uh, <laughs> It was a big enough class, you know, so we then we'd go to uh, the post office, and uh, he'd get the mail, and we'd go to the law firm, he'd, he'd do a little work, and then we'd go to Lou's Bakery, which was a, a deli on uh, River Street, not there anymore. And uh, Where was it on River? Uh, just right, I think it's right where uh, the bar is, River, uh, you know, the... I can't remember what they call it now, but... Uh, what is that, River Street Pub that's yeah. closed now there, yeah. too? Yeah. I think what's that, State? I think it's State and River. State and River, yeah. Um, and he'd get uh, uh, rye bread without don't, which is uh, without seeds, don't slice, and corned beef, and give us all a nickel for candy, which we couldn't eat till after lunch, and we'd go up back to his house, and and uh, sooner or later, our parents come pick us up. But And my you know father had you know acquaintances and... Uh, Father and mother had events. They were active culturally, politically, so we would go to Troy. But uh, uh, most of my life revolved around West St. Lake and, and that community. And we'll probably jump to this later, but when you eventually became mayor um, or moved into Troy yeah. uh, first before you became mayor, obviously there was you saw a big difference in change in Troy from the time when you visited when you were a kid to sort of the the later years what, i don't what was know that it was pretty uh you know when i was in college uh, troy was still that's i graduated from college in 1974 troy was still pretty vibrant even though it had been through the uh um you know urban renewal debacles uh and all that there are lots of people in the street there are movie theaters uh uh that change that societal change happened you know as the malls grew that's right around then all of a sudden the epicenter of some of that commerce left. So it was pretty rapid. It didn't change a lot when I was first back in Troy, uh, but it changed over time. Uh, and it, although I would say to people when I was mayor, uh, uh, and they would say, ah, Troy's not like it used to be. And I'd say, well, pick your head up. Look, 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 there's people here. You, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on. Troy. Even in that period of time, uh, Troy's still a pretty vibrant uh, community with great neighborhoods and all kinds of other great assets. You just mentioned a little bit about sort of like the the change in in Troy, I guess, urban renewal, malls, you know, the suburban flight. What did that what did that feel like at the time um, to see sort of the the city change from a uh, from a physical standpoint, the loss of buildings, et cetera? You know, what was your what was your recollection of that era more specifically about how Troy looked? You know, because it looks very different today um, just based on the pictures um, that I've seen. Yeah, sure. Sure. Well, I don't, you know, again, I think uh, when the when the mall was being put in, I remember my father and some of his colleagues all had opinions about how to do it with sort of a, a, a roof set, sort of an outdoor, indoor uh, concept as opposed to the mall they had. They, you know, keep the buildings that were there. That, that didn't happen. So people uh, had, people had, in Troy, had very specific opinions like they did back then. <laughs> like sure. They do today. Oh, no, that, that hasn't <laughs> changed. And, and I was, you know, around when, when uh, John Buckley tore down all the buildings that are now Riverfront Park. Um, and that was a, you know, huge uh, uh, debate. Although sometimes in retrospect, I look back and say, uh, well, you know, the park is not a terrible thing. You know, it's a good, good park. So, you know, some things age better over time or you can't tell what the future would have really held. Uh, uh, I was 
partially, you know, I moved to Troy uh, uh, after I got out of college and had an apartment on uh, Third Street. Uh, great place. Uh, Carl Erickson was the landlord, and he did. He's still in the city. He does great work. Uh, very historic and kind of thing. So uh, we would sit in a little balcony window and see traffic go by, and I would walk to to work and uh, or be nearby. You know, go to the bars and the stores and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I, I was on. I was active. Uh, you know, I come from a family that's that's. Uh, I mean, the family's been around Troy for a couple hundred years, uh, uh, and so there's a tradition of community presence. Not all political, uh, although some. Uh, and uh, I was on various boards, trip board, you know, Vander Heiden board, uh, other other boards, and 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 political kinds of things. So there was, uh, you know, political activity around uh, around the tearing down of the buildings and you know all that kind of stuff. And I would be on various sides of those issues. Yeah, I don't like the you don't really like the sort of uh, Troy changed narrative so much. Uh, Troy did change, and Troy, you know, used to be a population of 80,000 people. It was the 11th largest city in the state, and I can't remember what the number is, but it was a wealthy community at its inception. Uh, and so, you know, Troy is right now, when I was there, it's still true, it's hovering right around 50,000 uh, population. That's a pretty significant uh, drop, population drop, and that drives a lot of the problems. The, there's a, a building stocks that, you know, there's too many buildings that so that they aren't, economically uh, competitive they don't drive the price up although right now you're seeing changes in that in certain parts um, uh, and uh, and it's a built-out city uh, so there's not a lot of room for you know new development uh, uh, to take place uh, yeah that, that's definitely true I say that all the time it's like when you drive through Troy you never really leave Troy it's not like you have neighborhoods like Schenectady or Albany you can you, you tend to reach a certain area and you may drive through a, a much less dense area, and then arrive in a yeah. in a much denser neighborhood, never yeah. leaving the city. Yeah. But Troy, it's it's just block by block, at least on the flats. Yeah, from the yeah, from the, the, the Troy Menands Bridge all the, the way old up river to, wards are. Yeah, yeah, yeah they absolutely. never. Yeah. You know, it's actually true at the edges because you can't tell when you've left Troy a lot of times. Right, right. You know, that's sort of the old uh, uh, problem of you know not an ability to annex land and wealth moved three blocks north and. Uh, they're not in the taxing district anymore. So uh, I used to say that the, the good thing about Troy, meaning there's a period like Manhattan, is you can get out of it in 10 minutes walking. The bad news is you can get out of it in 10 minutes walking. So, uh, you know, the other resident, other development can happen pretty easily, still have all the access to the great things that are happening in, in any uh, city, uh, you know, all the services and, you know, community uh, uh, without necessarily paying for the legacy costs that yeah, are think, associated with that. I think the city at its at its widest point east to west might be seven might miles be long, two and a half miles wide. Two and a half, yeah. maybe three at most yeah. at the very southern tip, yeah. you know, corner to corner, like as the crow flies. No. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not much. And up in Lansingburg it's it's barely there. You know, well, <laughs> you can, yeah, that's right. You know. you know, you can almost spit from the top of the hill into mm-hmm. Saratoga yeah. County. It's not very yeah. not very wide there. Got a question? Have a suggestion? We want to hear from you. Drop us a line at mail at troystorypod.com. You can also find us on social media, including YouTube, Instagram, Threads, Facebook, and even the digital wasteland known as X, formerly Twitter. And now, back to the show. You mentioned your family's been around uh, Troy for multiple centuries yeah, Pattis, seven, Pattis seven eight family. generations yeah. really seven or wow okay yeah we came to try uh, uh elias pattison came from uh, stillwater uh, uh and uh was a merchant <clears throat> and he owned a hardware store and you know he came i think in the early 1800s uh and uh, uh his son is edward pattison uh with no middle initial, we have this family record, but he adopted the middle initial C because of his great admiration for Governor Clinton. And his admiration for Governor Clinton is because he built uh, Clinton's ditch, the Erie Canal, which is what partly what made Troy so prosperous because now you can get goods from New York City. Made, it's what made New York City a harbor. The Erie Canal, now you can come up the river and go west and distribute to a larger part of the country. And so that was part of what created wealth in Troy. And uh, Elias was, you know, a merchant, and and uh, uh, there's a story about he sold uh, 
sold the business to uh, someone who uh, left all the goods in the in the river and it froze and of course he he held the paper so he never got paid uh, so uh, he, he never got rich but uh, uh, and then there's a long line of Edwards uh, Edward uh, Ed, Ed, the first Edward uh, was read the law um, and owned buildings Harmony Hall uh, was a place he owned and rented still is where some of the tech companies are located right at the pyramid Kennedy Hall and Harmony Hall are oh, yeah, yeah, right yeah. third in river um, and uh, and then his son was a lawyer, and his my grandfather was a lawyer, and my father's a lawyer, and I'm not. <laughs> and <laughs> but I'm, you not became, a, I'm not an Edward either. So. Yeah, well, and he, and he became mayor too, to to yeah. be perfectly well, fair, yeah. which was probably not something that your great 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 grandfather could have possibly anticipated. Well, I don't know. They were pretty. They were you know upper class. They uh, uh, we participated. I think one of them was on a council somewhere and. You know they're pretty uh, prominent members of the community. Uh, well, at least they would have been proud. I'm sure it's kind of oh, sure. it's just kind yeah, of cool sure. to yeah, kind yeah. Of cool uh, to it was think very about. cool. It's a cool thing. Yeah. That being said, your your father was also in public service. Yeah. Uh, was a member of the United States Congress. Represented yeah. Troy and I don't know what other municipalities. Well, that originally the first one had some Albany in it, uh, which later got moved out. It was the southern part of Albany, city of Albany, uh, Columbia, uh, Green, uh, Saratoga. Warren, Washington, little little town of Minerva in Essex County. Uh, it was bigger than the state of Connecticut. Uh, the, the oh, district. really? That was how big the district yeah. was at the time. Yeah, wow. Yeah. It's still pretty big, but, uh, uh, you know, it's changed. A lot of, lot of, of course. A lot of changes. We lost the, some of the Democratic uh, vote in Albany. That got moved out in redistricting one time. So, What was that like when he decided, your dad decided to run for Congress? How old were you? No, I was, uh, I was uh, 18 uh, or 19. Uh, he was in the politics before that uh he uh he he was the coordinator for the kennedy campaign regionally when when john kennedy was running for office he, i think he ran for town supervisor in sand lake and got i, I, I i'm not even sure my mother voted for him i mean it was it was pr- pr- pretty republican community uh and uh uh he was county treasurer uh in in, in russell county and uh he had run for Congress once before, uh, in 1970, he ran against Carlton King, and uh, then ran again in 74, which was the Watergate year. So they, he, he's described as a Watergate baby that, uh, you know, the Democrats swept post, post-Nixon post and uh, gained majorities and, and won in places where they'd never won before. That was, you know, I, I came home from college. I was in college. He decided to run. Uh, I, I took six, eight weeks off, which didn't really work out too well for my first year uh, uh, grades, but uh, I came back. I was really the only person in the campaign office for, for you know, a little while uh, until he hired some some other folks. Uh, we had our campaign headquarters down in the Rice Building, you know, because my father and his brother, John, owned the Rice Building. And uh, uh, then I mostly was the guy assigned uh, to travel with him and uh, because... Uh, my father's a talker and uh, likes to communicate with people. And you know, campaign, you got to move on, and keep keep going. So you were the body man. I was the body man, but I could say tell him things that other people couldn't because he <laughs> he can't fire me. <laughs> um, and uh, so we did did that. We did a lot of travel. Uh, it was very exciting, uh, and winning was obviously very exciting. And uh, he was a young. Uh, you know, Buck at the time. So, and it, the year that he won, you mentioned it was the post Watergate election, and there was this sort of nationwide sweep. I believe it was the largest. I think it was the largest freshman class he was. ever in yeah. in congressional uh, history yeah. on on both sides of the aisle. I think Democrats and Republicans. Mm-hmm. I believe there were there were fresh yeah. faces that were right. elected in. I think. Yeah, that was a big deal because they suddenly realized that when they got to, he went down to Congress. You know, you do. Uh, sort of training is the wrong word, but you go down for orientation. And a bunch of them sort of realized that they had 90 new people, uh, and that was an actual voting block. Uh, so they organized the class of 74. My father was with a couple other guys that did that. And they had, uh, they, they thought they had whack. They thought they could change things. And so they actually did. They, they, they changed the, the, the uh, way chairmen were elected. Uh, and not, not, you know, uh, people were pretty 
upset about that. I it mean, was specifically w- changing the seniority. The seniority. You had at least a, 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 to interview three people or, or something. I can't remember the change, but it wasn't 100% you know, seniority. And, uh, you know, the, there were people that uh, weren't happy uh, about that. That's also a time when constituent services were were really emerging. And my father had a mobile office. He had a van. Oh, really? Uh, that uh, traveled around. Instead of having, you know, offices in three different places, he had one office and a mobile office. And uh, my friend Tim Holbert, who uh, was later the chamber president of the Chamber of Commerce, was the the kid from Green County that they. He was my age, and he lived in the apartment with me, and you know, he was the mobile office guy. And he'd pull up in some community and open the doors and take constituent calls and That's fill out a, forms. And I, I imagine it was probably pretty innovative at the time. I don't think a time, lot of people I, were yeah. doing it. I yeah. mean, you think about U.S. Congress, oftentimes people would be there forever, and there was uh, not a tremendous deal of trans- transparency. I don't mean that in a negative way, just yeah. that Congress didn't operate the way that it operates now, which was television cameras yeah. and yeah. committee hearings. Yeah. And yeah. you just felt like your co- if your congressman gave you any degree of attention, it was like a big special thing when really they... Yeah. It's the other way around. They work for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, he was pretty big on that. And, uh, uh, of course, the you know, I mean, and now so much of a con- congressional office is around constituent services. Uh, it's amazing, you know, things that you think the bureaucracy would just do, but uh, they do when the congressman calls. But, he, you know, he he won. He won in 74. And uh, uh, I was, at that point, uh out of college uh, when I said I left college in first ran, that was his first campaign uh, the second campaign I did something similar but uh, um, you know after he won he he, he uh, sat me down and said uh, you know look uh, you're not going to get a job with me and you're not going to get a job with anybody that it looks like I got you a job you know in, you know so he was very uh, lily white as they as they say uh, and so of course uh, I got a job at the Rensselaer County ARC Association of Retired Children, which my mother was actually, uh, you know, very in, involved in, and I was a, a weekend counselor and a, a later a case manager uh, for the organization. But um, uh, he made sure that uh, we weren't benefiting from his election, well, which is commendable in in the grand scheme. I, mean, I think, yeah, yeah. You certainly don't want to be the, matter, right? Yeah, for sure. Right. The, the son of the congressman yeah. doesn't get. And he moved. To, he moved to DC. Uh, I mean, he he went, but the family didn't, because uh, he thought, and you can get away with it when you're in the East Coast. But he thought you ought to drive to work, not move to Washington, right? You ought to still stay home, and uh, so he would come back every weekend. And and I really actually wasn't that involved at that point. I had, you know, was out of the house and had a job. And uh, again, I was I hung around those guys because my friend Tim was working for my father. But uh, you know, a lot of those things weren't things I had direct knowledge of because I was doing other things. And I, you know, along the way, I got uh, bought a house in uh, downtown Troy and uh, well, you know, I got married and had a kid and that's about the time that comes to thinking about running for mayor, so. Like what you hear? Well, then it might be time to give us a flattering review. Reviews are the best way to make the mysterious and magical podcast algorithm suggest our modest little show to other listeners. And if you're feeling extra generous, please share this episode with a friend, family member, or that special person in your life. They'll thank you for it, and we will be forever in your debt. Troy Story, a podcast for the Collar City, streaming everywhere you get your podcasts. Visit TroyStoryPod.com to learn more. All right, back to the show. What was the precipitating factor behind you deciding to run for mayor? Was it something you had considered? Was it something that you had been encouraged to do? Was there something happening in the city at the time? Well, sure. Absolutely. I mean, well, I mean, first of all, I, I tried to run for city council oh, for I didn't some know that. period of time, uh, but I wasn't, the party didn't nominate me. The party, the, the district was uh, around Kennedy Towers and it was viewed as the senior district which is true uh, and so a guy that lived in the building was the nom- democratic nominee and he he won uh, so i was interested i was active in other things uh, uh, you know boards and community organizations um and i they were switching there was a referendum to switch from city manager to mayor uh and i and a couple other people including pat madden um 
uh, Patrick Madden being Patrick the Madden. most recent former mayor. Yeah, uh, we're and a guy named Mark Smutney who was a, a pastor at the First Press Church and Community Active ran a campaign to keep the city manager. Uh, I thought it was better to keep the city manager on the theory it was better to hire talent than elect it. Um, my wife Laura tells me that when I went in to vote for that other things. Uh, I came out and said, if this goes through, I'm running for mayor. I have no knowledge. I don't have no memory of that, uh, that particular comment, but that's, she, she reports that. So, uh, and I had, uh, you know, at the, you know, I had encouragement from friends and again, Tim Holbert was the president of the chamber of commerce and he encouraged me, but I, this part of the story is I, I announced, I, uh, you know, entered into a campaign mode and, uh, the democratic chair, uh, uh, called me up and said, Mark, I'm not supporting you for being the Democrat nominee. There's a guy named Bill McMahon, a very well-known guy. That what, what was Bill's name? Bill McMahon uh, uh, was the chair of the Commission on Corrections, I think, uh, and lived in Troy, lived up on the east side. Um, and that was who Tom wanted to uh, be the nominee. Who was, uh, the, who was the chairman at the time? Tom Matthews. Tom Matthews. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I was, you know, I had a family name, but you know, I wasn't really engaged in politics. And how old were you at the time? Forty-seven, I think, around. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, he said, "Watch you run for council president." I said, "I don't want to be council president." And he said, "Looks like I'm going to, you know, I'm going to try to get the nomination, and if I don't win, then I'll support the whoever is." Uh, you know, it's. Uh, and he said, "Well, okay, you know, but uh, and maybe I'll be calling you back one of these, you know." Well, two weeks later, he called me back because Bill McMahon turned it down, didn't want it, and. And truthfully, there was no one else that wanted it. The city was in a crisis, uh, all kinds. I mean, the, the Grand Al years, uh, you can, for better or worse, were, were chaotic and, and uh, lots of drama. Um, uh, and they were switching. It was going to switch to a mayoral form of, of government. So. What was the precipitating factor then? Was it, was it the decline in the city's city? Like, no, it was the opportunity. The, the things you, you, you can do. Uh, in that kind of environment, you can't do other times. There's things that you can, you know, take, you know, never let a crisis pass by without it. The crisis is an opportunity. Uh, uh, you know, that was really one of my best. It was at, by the time I took office, it was an acknowledged crisis. People didn't really debate that there was a crisis. So some actions were t were able to be taken that you couldn't maybe politically get away with another another time. So I did it. I was always into politics. I it wasn't... Uh, you know, dreaming about being mayor, it was just an opportunity that presented itself, and uh, I thought it was a chance to do so. I've been at the ARC for 19, 20 years, yeah. so it was a good time to, to change careers. And if I didn't win, then I still had the ARC, the place I loved, working for people with disabilities and, you know, terrific organization, terrific cause. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was, just, it was just an opportunity. You, you mentioned uh, the when you when you were elected mayor, everyone acknowledged it was a crisis. Even when you look back at the, the newspaper clippings at the time, because I, I went back and looked mm -hmm. at some of the old Troy record stories that are still up. I mean, the city was in dire financial yeah, shape. Yeah, there was a, a, a recession uh, that uh, caused the then governor, Mario Cuomo, to cut state aid in half in the middle of a fiscal year. Um, and uh, that is tough to manage, right? That's real tough. Uh, Troy at the time uh, didn't really take manage it. They kind of doubled down and they they uh, uh, got creative. Uh, people say you should get in creative in government, but it's not always a good idea. Um, <laughs> uh, and so they sold city hall and our parks and our parking garages essentially to ourselves to do a an LDC, uh, and uh, uh, that generated thirty five million dollars of income, which they used to build the central police, uh, fire station, uh, the South Troy Community Center. Uh, and, and for people wondering what the South Troy Community Center is. Yeah, it's right off, uh, it's, you know, uh, I don't even know what that street is. It's The canal is uh, right on the edge, and uh, now it's owned by Troy City Schools, I'm pretty sure. Uh, we sold it to the Troy Boys and Girls Club at the, when I was there. but And then I think at one point it may have been went with sages sage bought it too, right yeah. um but they used the money to build those buildings and then they also used the money to sort of hide the deficit uh that was that they were running it's not you know again very tough situation revenues were going down expenditures were going up 
uh, and that's a prescription for disaster, right? You can't you can't make make those things uh, meet. So Troy really was, uh, and and that you know the previous administrations had taken uh, actions, and some I'm not saying they weren't necessary actions, but laid off 47 employees, uh, uh, city employees, instituted work rules that weren't ultimately deemed to be legal. Uh, we had to sort of make up. Uh, some of those kinds of things, uh, but it was a terrible time and tough, tough situation. So, um, Troy's Troy was in in a deep uh, crisis. In fact, the the day I became mayor was the day that they, the, the a financial control board, Troy supervisory board, was empowered. And they were created before that, but uh, you know became uh, in power the day I came. And they basically controlled Troy's finances. They didn't tell me what to do, but they said, do a four-year financial plan. And if you got an expenditure, almost any expenditure, show me how it fits in the four-year financial plan. I, I, I joke that if, if I wanted to spend all my money on flower pots, they would have said, okay, can you afford it? You know, they lived in our building. We had a couple of accountants in our building, and right. a couple of lawyers that were in our building, and uh, they, were all, they were all over us. But I, I thought it was very important for us to control our own destiny. Right, so I didn't want them telling me what to do. I wanted to comply, uh, but I wanted it to be a, our initiatives, our ideas, our, our our priorities. And when I say our, I mean the city's. You know, not my priorities. That was a big thing for me. Uh, what got us in that mess was, in some sense, people wanting things that we couldn't afford, and, and elected officials who didn't want to, you know, take tough stances. And so, the, but the root of that is you got to convince the people that these are the changes that need to be made. And I, I dubbed it the hope agenda, that, you, you, you know, change doesn't come easily. Uh, it certainly doesn't come easily when you're taking things away from people. It comes more easily when you say, we're going to do this for a better day. And we've always done that. We save for a war. We save for our kids' birthdays. We save for college. When you see a benefit, it's a future, you know, there's hope for the future, then you're willing to sacrifice. If you say to people, just, I'm going to, will you sacrifice? I mean, that's just not a, that's not a good strategy. So you got to give people hope for the future. And we, we try to do that with a, a variety of uh, plans, initiatives early on. What do you remember about the race itself? So you, you, you get in the race, you become the nominee. What was that year? What was that race like? It was um, you running. Well, there was a lot of people in the race. There were four other, pe- two, three other people in the race. Kathy Jimeno was the Republican uh, nominee. Uh, uh, Mike Rourke uh, was a lawyer in Troy and ran on the, the li- liberal line. Uh, and uh, another Mike Petruska ran on the conservative line. Um, and uh, I actually primaried in both those. I, re- I wrote, won the conservative line, uh, and I tied in the liberal line, and they gave it to the other. Uh, guys so uh, but there was a there was people in the you know a lot of uh, uh, a lot of people in the race and uh, uh, I I don't know if I really knew it's easier looking back than it is uh, you know at the time because uh, you know I just uh, I had a campaign I thought I ran a really good campaign I had a campaign uh, manager Uh, we 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 raised money uh, and uh, uh, you know, did the stuff you had to do. Not just uh, we we uh, walked the city and talked to people, and I I always loved that. I would always go to the door and and uh, take a little pause and say, what do, what do you think? And wait a while and see what they had to say because I was interested in learning from them what you know they thought the solutions might be. Uh, according to Wikipedia, and we'd have to verify this, it says that you um, defeated. Uh, Kathy Jimeno, who you mentioned, mm-hmm. uh, Michael Petruska, yeah. and Michael Rourke. Yeah, yeah, right. Those are the those are the three. So you, yeah. you hit the nail on the head. Yeah, um, that was November seventh, nineteen ninety five, was election yeah. day. Yeah, um, and it was you know again it was the first time there was a mayor. So there was a lot of uh, you know the city charter even still isn't really written as if there was a, a, a mayoral form of government. It sort of blends a lot of the things between city manager and and mayor. It replaced the name mayor. There was a mayor before. It was the head of the council. Now the mayor's elected chief elected officer, um, and so there are things like, for example, first uh, council meeting. People said, "Well, why aren't you up at the dais?" I said, "Because I'm not the 
I'm not the council. You know, I'm the mayor. Right. It's a totally uh, different. Totally, it's a totally different, different job. The county executive doesn't go sit there and speak only when spoken to and answer questions like that. So it's a you know a tough change for people. Uh, right. Right. Because pr- prior to that, the mayor was a member, just sort of similar to not exactly. Like yeah. Sir the council Thomas president was the was called the mayor. So, right. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Do you love email newsletters? Who doesn't? Head over to TroyStoryPod.com to subscribe for email updates from your new favorite podcast, including upcoming guests, episodes, and even bonus content. Well, what are you waiting for? Okay, let's get back to the show. I mean, when you, when you were knocking on doors, were you getting... Finances, finances, finances. No, were, but no. where people were talking about, you know, no, people never. You know, nobody ever got elected from a campaign and said, "I'm going to balance the books." I mean, just it's not what you know. People care about f- fiscal. I, you know, that was I ran on fiscal stability. But uh, you know, people. It's, and it, and Troy is very different. You know, if you're up at Emerald Greens when you knock on a door, the door is open. Somebody's in the backyard. I mean, the, their issues are snow plowing and garbage pickup and that kind of stuff but if you're in a different neighborhood it's about crime and it's about uh public safety or you know there's just very different different uh, issues in each uh, uh each part of the city so um uh, but it was a crisis people know it was a crisis and and i think i came to it with a kind of family legacy uh that helped and i ran on a campaign of fiscal stability economic vitality and cleaner and safer uh, so, um, uh, again, but it was close, you know, it was, a and a, a, an interesting time. It's, uh, the, you know, just prior to that, uh, governor Pataki had beat Mario Cuomo. Uh, so, uh, I was very fortunate in the sense there are a lot of Democrats, talented, experienced Democrats who were looking for work and wouldn't normally have worked for the city, but they were w- willing to work for me. And I got assembled a, uh, a really high quality team. You don't do this job alone. The mayor's job is not a solo job. Uh, you have to build a team and build an organization, uh, and or at least that was my uh, approach to it. Election night, uh, nineteen ninety five. You went to bed. Mark Streb told me this story. Yeah. Who was your yeah. campaign manager at the yeah. time? And he told me the story that you went to you went yeah. to bed thinking you lost, yep. and you woke up and you found out that you won. Well, Tom Matthews called me, and I I, I don't know if I might make this up, but I think he said I don't know if it's good news or bad news, but I think he might have won. Um, and, uh, and so, and, and all of a sudden I realized I could hear all this noise outside and it was all the, the, uh, TV trucks, you know, with their generators, uh, running, setting up uh, outside your house to, yeah, yeah. To I went back to bed, but then I couldn't sleep. So I got up <laughs> and I think I was probably doing interviews at four in the morning. Uh, it, and it turns out that, uh, took, took, uh, six, seven weeks to finally count, but I won by, I think it was 119 votes. So, uh, pretty very close race, close considering race. that sometimes that's the divide in a council race. Oh, sure. You know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And we had the actually turnout, uh, just part of the historical trend. I think the total turnout was 12,000. Oh, God. People. And we're down to seven or something now, you know. Uh, in, in, in a city of 50,000 people, 12,000. It d- doesn't sound like a lot, but it's. Uh, it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and obviously, Kathy Gimino went on to do just fine. She went on to become county executive. For yeah, she worked for the for Senator Bruno. Senator Bruno at that time had just, like in the interim, just became Senate Majority Leader. So she worked for Senator Bruno, uh, and then later ran for county executive one and served for served for sixteen years. Yeah, right, she did quite four a, terms. Long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kathy Jimino, who's Pat Madden's sister. Yes, correct. That too. That's yeah, an, yeah, that's yeah. important piece of yeah. uh, context yeah. in the in the historical, yeah. you know, in the the wider tapestry of of Troy. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. the the connections are often yeah. there. You don't see them, but they're definitely there. But we started strong. You know, it was again. It was a. I, it was my goal was, uh, and you can see, I, so, you know, was to engage people. I was. I, I always wanted to engage people. So, uh, I started out my first day mayor at you know, five in the morning up at public utilities because. Uh, you know, there were a lot of calls about, you know, laying off staff and I wanted to have a conversation with them. And I told them just, I would be direct with them. And then I went that day to every city department, every, you know, shift, police, ending up like the police change of shift. Um, the uh, outgoing administration had hired a bunch of firemen and a bunch of police officers December 31st. Uh, I ended up having to lay off. I couldn't lay off the firefighters for various reasons, but the, the uh, there were five police officers that we had to lay off. Um, and I told him I went and met with him. And I said, you know, um, I don't want to do this. I'm going to try everything I can do to bring you back. But, you know, we can't afford you right now. Or I don't know if we can afford you right now. 
Uh, and I, you know, th there were a lot of protests. Uh, I, we 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 off, we raised the taxes twenty one percent, water rates thirty eight percent. It wasn't philosophy; it's math. We had a four million dollar budget and a four and thirty two million dollar uh, revenue. Uh, so I went to the council and said, uh, uh, you know, I'll do my part if you can do your part. I'll you know I'll manage the budget, but we need to raise and that even that all those things only raised I think four million dollars and. In revenue, so we still had you know many challenges. I, that those tax increases didn't get us ahead. You got know, you, got you back to zero. Maybe you know not even. So uh, again, we we went from and I didn't do it. We went from twice a week garbage to one time a week garbage. Uh, you know there are a lot of changes that were made. Uh, even previous administrations made trying to cut costs. Um, so it was a tough time for the public. Tough time for the community. We hope you enjoyed part one of our interview with former Troy Mayor Mark Patterson. I can't thank him enough for agreeing to be part of the pod and revisit this often forgotten or perhaps misremembered era in the Collar City. Tune in next time for part two, where Mark discusses some of the major projects undertaken during his tenure as mayor, his working relationship with then New York State Senate Majority Leader Joe Bruno, and the 1999 mayoral election when he sought a second term to lead the Collar City into the new millennium. I love the job of being mayor, being in the mix and, and uh, trying to solve uh, problems. Uh, so there's never any question that I was going to run r run for re-election. You know, I thought we had a great council slate. The, the count, we lost the council that uh, year, and I think that's part of the, you know, the tradition of Troy. If you're doing things that are, are the right, I'm going to say this in air quotes, uh, the right thing to do financially, they're not always the popular thing to do. Uh, and you do pay a price. Please don't forget to hit the subscribe button on whatever streaming service you're using to hear the show to make sure you get notified about upcoming chapters along with special bonus content. Until then, love yourself, love one another, and may Pod save Troy. Troy Story is hosted, written, edited, and produced by me, John Salka. Our theme music is by Stephen J. Goldman at Four Legs Records. Like what you heard? Please give us a rating wherever you listen to podcasts. This is so helpful for getting others to find our show. Want to know more about the show? Visit TroyStoryPod.com to see upcoming episodes, guests, and bonus content. Thanks for listening.